morning, everybody. Let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. I get the feeling my microphone is not working so well. Is that correct? All right. Okay, how about now? Is that better? It's still quiet, okay. Maybe I can move it. How about that? Okay, good. All right, so last time we, uh, we talked about transformation matrices and I warned you to be really, really careful about making sure that you know what basis you're in and being consistent, and then I made a mistake involving not doing that. So let's, uh, let's put up the slide again where that happened. This is the corrected version. Um, so basically what I did is I had half of it in a different basis than the other half, which, was, which is not good. And so thanks to the person who pointed it out, here's the, here's the corrected version of how we uh, set up these transformation matrices. The matrices were right, it's just that the answer was not consistent with the, the vector that I applied it to. So, sorry about that, mistakes do happen, but I always want to correct them. So I do want to point out, like, if things like that happen in class, I really do want you to tell me, and so I, I appreciate that when, when people do. Um, you know, sometimes we'll have time to stop and, and clear it up right away, other times, we'll just have to, to move on and deal with it later, but you know, we always want to make sure to get that cleared up so stuff is clear. Um, does anybody have any questions about this or other stuff that, that has gone on so far? Okay, that's good, yes? Sorry, I, for the projection on the x-axis, I was wondering why it was, uh, the growing column right there, which is 0, 0, 0, 0. Well, so you just, you're, you're just ending up with your, you just want the projection on the x-axis. So that's the only, so 1, 1 is the only cell that you want to, to have anything in it. The, the uh, first element on the diagonal. Okay, cool. All right, so um, we're going to go in and talk about group theory. And today is going to be cool because we're going to learn how to take the two skills that we've learned so far and put them together to do something useful. So, so far we've learned how to put molecules and actually any kind of different shapes into point groups. And we also learned how to set up transformation matrices. And now we're going to see how this actually has an application in chemistry. The first application we're going to do is to chemical bonding. And I like to do these examples because we learn the general formalism for going through and, and using the group theory, but the advantage is that the answer you get is something that you all already know from general chemistry. So it's really easy to check your work. If you get the wrong answer, you're going to know right away that it's wrong. This is going to be helpful because later on we're going to be doing these applications to spectroscopy where it won't be so obvious what's happening. So it's, it's good to make sure that, uh, that you get what you expect when we talk about this in relation to bonding. Another sort of general uh, strategy that, thing that I want to point out before I forget is um, with respect to putting things in the right basis and making sure you're consistent. When you go to do these things on the exam, we give lots of partial credit for different things and also there are just different ways to get the right answer. Please make sure that whatever you're doing, you write down what basis you're using, draw pictures, draw your coordinate system. Just make sure that, that uh, the TAs and I understand what you're doing, wh whatever it may be. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go through talking about point groups. So we're gonna start out talking about water, which is in the C2V point group. So of course we could be talking about any object that fits in that group. And if we look at our character table, we um, see that we have these operations. And last time we went through all the various things that are in the character table. And we talked about the irreducible representations, which are these things that are called A, B, C, E, et cetera. And I said that they describe how things transform under these operations. We're going to talk about what that means. So we need to introduce the, uh, 
the idea of being able to look at something and say, okay, when I perform this operation, it's a valid symmetry operation, but we have to be able to distinguish between whether it leaves the object completely unchanged or not. And so in order to do this, I've labeled these hydrogens red and blue. In reality, of course, with a real water molecule, we can't tell the difference between those hydrogens. They're the same. But in our minds, we can you know, designate them as red and blue and, and keep track of where they go. Okay, so if we perform the identity operation, it doesn't change. That's what the identity means. But if we do a C2 rotation, it's a, it's a fine uh, symmetry operator. It leaves the, the molecule unchanged as far as the hydrogens being indistinguishable, <clears throat> but it does swap them. Now if we look at our reflections in the XZ plane, which notice my little coordinate system here, that's the one that's the plane of the screen. That one leaves it unchanged. Whereas the other one, which goes through the, the middle of the molecule, swaps them. So, okay, simple enough, right? We want to be able to, uh, to look at how we can use this. So now we need to set up matrices to perform our transformations. And in this case, the basis that we're looking at is the hydrogens. So the basis is that's, that's the thing that, that we're talking about. And what we're going to see is that the transformation matrix for a particular operation depends on what basis you're using. So I can't say, make a, I, I can't make a transformation matrix for a C2 rotation completely in general. I have to specify what I'm talking about. So last time we talked about little unit vectors pointing along the axis, either in a plane or in three space. Now our basis is the hydrogens on this water molecule. And so for um, the identity matrix, we need to look at the thing that keeps our hydrogens unchanged. So now notice I'm calling them H and H prime. And so our identity matrix is always going to be, we're always going to get something that has ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, but how big it is depends on what it is. So here we have two things. We get a, a two by two matrix for that. And notice that its character is two. So that's the, uh, that's the character chi. So remember, that's what you get when you add the elements on the diagonal. And it's, we're working with character tables. So we know that that has something to do with those, those elements that go into the irreducible representations. And we're going to see how in a little bit. So in many point groups, there's a shortcut that we can use where we can say, all right, I don't need to set up this whole matrix. I can just say, you know, we have two things and neither one of them changed. And so we can add them up and get the character two. So this is a shortcut that often works. I want to point out that it doesn't always. So if we have things that have trigonal kinds of symmetry, so like if we're in the D3H or C3V point group, this becomes a lot harder. And we'll see some examples of that later. But in many cases, we can use this shortcut where we can just count the things that change and find the character right away. And I'll point out when we're able to, to do that. OK, so now we can look at our C2 operation. And we know, we already know what that does. It swaps the hydrogens. So if that's our basis, if one changes places with the other, then that character is going to be 0. And we can use that shortcut. And we can also set up the actual matrix. So that's the matrix that makes these things flip position. So I'm not going to do the other two for this thing right this minute. I will leave it as an exercise. Question? Uh, why do you change the prime? Is because it, before it was blue had the prime, now red has the prime? Because you said you flipped it. That's just because my picture is wrong. There has to be at least one every lecture. Thanks. So the colors are right, and the vector is right. But yeah, the prime shouldn't be on the red one. That is correct. OK, so now let's look at what happens if we're talking about objects that can change their sign. So for hydrogen atoms, our only uh, option here is they can stay in the same place. They can move to a different place. And so we get ones or zeros for the character. Question? Sorry, why 
why is x equal to 0 again? Um, it's not x, it's chi. And that's, that's the trace of the matrix or the character of the matrix. And it's what you get when you add up all the elements on the diagonal. How did you find it before like, the matrix came up? So that is, that is the shortcut that we can sometimes use and sometimes not. And, and I'm going to keep giving examples of this. So in the first example, the, we have two hydrogen atoms and neither one of them changed place or, or changed at all. And so that, so we can say, okay, there are two things and they didn't change, so that means the character of this thing is two. In this case, they swapped places, and so the character of that is zero. So we're saying, you know, in the cases where the shortcut works, I'm going to show you some examples where it doesn't, you can say, if something stays the same, it gets one. If it changes places with another element, it gets zero. And if it changes sign, it gets minus one. Yeah. So of course, and it's, you know, again, this is, a, this is a heuristic. It's a shortcut that you can use sometimes. It doesn't always work. And it doesn't work when you have things where you can't, you, where you can't map one element onto another very easily with the symmetry operations we have. And I'll show you cases where that's true. Yes? So for clarification, that's just for the transformation. That's the character of the transformation. That's the character that, that goes under that transformation. So what we're doing here is we're making a reducible representation for how a particular thing, which is our basis, transforms under all the symmetry elements. And we're going to build up to how to actually use that to find out something about the molecule. But for right now, we're just practicing. We're just seeing how different things transform under the symmetry elements. Yes? Um, are those the characters, uh, the numbers? Tables? That's, so that's a good question. So the characters in those tables are the characters of the irreducible representations. So those are they're the very basic representations of how objects transform <coughs> under the symmetry operations. And, we're, and I don't think that's clear right now, but it will be as we go through more examples. What we're making now is called a reducible representation. And so we can, we can add up different combinations of those irreducible representations in the table and make a reducible representation, which is what we're, we're making up now. And we're going to see how that works, and we're going to learn a formula for reducing it. And that's going to enable us to find, how, you know, for instance, how many and which kind of orbitals can be involved in making a particular kind of bond. And again, that's why I like these kind of examples, because you already know the answer to that. You've all learned it in general chemistry. So it's, it's very, the procedure that we're going to learn is a little bit involved, but it's very easy to check your work because the answer that you get is something that you already know for right now. Later, we're going to do harder things, but. Okay, so here's another example. We're going to look at the same kind of thing. So now we're still in the C2V point group, right? But now we're looking at a different molecule. So we have OCl2, and our basis is two particular p orbitals on these chlorine atoms. And the way I drew the picture, you can see that they have opposite phase from each other. And one thing that people get confused about is why did I pick this as my basis? What about all the rest of the p orbitals on the chlorine atoms? What about the p orbitals on the oxygen atom? And the answer is, I don't care. I'm not looking at those right now. So you get to set up the basis. You're making up the, uh, you know, the problem that, that we're looking at. You know, in this case, I'm making it up. So this is, this is what we're happening to look at. The choice of the basis here is arbitrary because we're just practicing seeing how things transform. In a real scenario where you're actually trying to figure something out, you're going to be looking at which direction bonds are pointing because you might want to learn which orbitals go into making up those bonds. When we start talking about molecular motions, our basis is going to be a little x, y, and z axis on every atom in the molecule so that we can learn about its motions. Those are examples of realistic things that we might come up with to solve a problem. This is just for practice. We just want to see how it works. OK, so again, if we look at the identity, we can use the shortcut here and say, all right, we have these two p orbitals. And I know that they're not going to change when we do the identity. So our character equals 2. We can also make up the transformation matrix. And we always know what it's going to be for the identity. It's, it's just ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And now look what happens when we do a C2 rotation. So A and B swap places, but their signs don't change. And 
this is important to, to, to realize. The signs of the orbitals, are, I'm, I'm saying, are, go, are going with the positions. So the sign of the thing that on the left is the same as it was before. However, the identity of these orbitals swap places. So since they change places, the character of that matrix is zero, and it looks just like it did in the hydrogen atom place, in the hydrogen atom case. And we can see how the transformation matrix works. Okay, so now let's look at what happens with a reflection. So again, my XZ plane is in the, the plane of the screen. So if I do that reflection, these orbitals are going to you know, reflect through the screen and they stay in the same place. The identities of A and B don't change, but they both change sign. So that tells me that the character now is minus two using our little heuristic that we have two things and they both change sign. And then we can also set up the appropriate transformation matrix. So what I want you to get out of this, it is, it is kind of a toy example. There, there's not necessarily anything that useful about knowing about these particular p orbitals. What I want you to see is you know, just how we can, you know, first of all, tell, telling the difference between the elements changing places, things swapping around and changing sign and the fact that those are separate from each other. Um, I also want to point out that exactly this problem was on the exam last year. So this is, uh, you know, it's a good example of things that, that you might need to be able to do. Yes? So the last one, did you, did you kind of like demonstrate what you, you know, how you rotated it? I didn't rotate it, I reflected it. The, so the XZ plane is the plane of the screen and I reflected it about through that, uh, yeah. Yes. You chose both the shape. You, you chose one of the shaded to be up and one of the shaded to be down. Down on A, up on B. What if you chose both the shaded to be up on A and up on B? I'm so glad you asked that because that's what we're going to do. Okay. So. Um, okay. So, as we, you know, as we anticipate, this really shows you that how these matrix, how these matrices end up coming out depends on both what's the operation and what are you doing it to. The basis is really important. And so this is why I'm saying, you know, when you go to do this on the exam, draw lots of pictures. Tell us what you're using for the basis because there might be equivalent ways of doing the same thing and also you want to be able to get partial credit for your work. So make sure you, you make it clear what you're doing. Okay, so for this case, we are looking at, uh, you know, first we have the identity matrix. That's always going to be the same, so we don't need to talk about it again. But now if we do a C2 rotation, not only do these things change sign, or not only do they change places, but they also change sign. Because now when we turn it around, the, things, the, uh, the darker lobes that were pointing forward are now pointing back. So in this case, we get negative ones in the off diagonal elements. So that transformation depends not only on the operation that we're doing, but also on the object that we're doing it to. And so again, just to bring it back to what's in the character table, all of those irreducible representations are objects that transform in different ways under all of the symmetry operations in the point group. You know, again, this, the things that we're making here are reducible representations. They can be generated by adding up different irreducible representations, and we are going to see how. Okay, so again, let's reflect it in the, in the XZ plane. Same thing, nothing changes places, but they do change sign. So that one is the same as it was in the other example. So, okay, so now we've illustrated how we can look at these things and make up transformation matrices for operations in a particular basis. We have learned that the basis is really important to figure out what these matrices are. And you know, we're starting to get a sense of how this goes together with the things that are in the character table. Okay, so now let's look at some objects that transform in ways that give us reducible representations. 
So again, here's a point that people often get confused about when they're first learning this, this concept. So here we have a px orbital. And you might say, if we just have a px orbital off by itself in space, it doesn't belong to the C2V point group. You know, yet I'm doing these examples in the C2V point group. That's because we decided that that's the basis that we're working in because of something about the problem. So we were looking at OCL2, that molecule is in the C2V point group, that's what we're doing. So now we can, we can consider various orbitals and objects that are associated with that, that uh, molecule and look at how it transforms under operations in that point group, but we're not starting over and assigning the orbital to a point group. Make sense to everybody? That's, I just, I bring that up because that is something that people tend to get confused about. Yes? Are the different sides of the P orbital different colors just to show the different orientations of it? The, the two sides of the P orbital are different colors because P orbitals have a node in the middle, so it changes sign. So that's the, that's the phase of the orbital. And, you know, of course, that's, that's going to be important because things might change sign under some of the operations. Okay, so now we have a px orbital. We're in, the two, we're in the C2V point group because I said so. I know that a p orbital alone in space does not belong to that point group, but we're using this to set up a problem that involves a molecule that belongs to that point group. And we're going to consider how that orbital transforms under each symmetry operation. And it helps if you have your character table out and open to the right point group when we do this. Okay, so if I do the identity, nothing changes. So it gets a character of one. If I do a C2 rotation, it moves around, and so it changes sign. And so that means it gets a character of minus one. If I do a reflection, in the xz plane, which again is the plane of the screen, nothing happens, doesn't change. So it gets a character of one. If we do the same thing in the yz plane, now it does change sign, and so it gets a character of minus one. So that's how we set up our representation in this group. And so if we go to the character table and look at the C2V table, what you'll notice is you have this, this pattern of characters, one minus one, one minus one, and that belongs to, or it corresponds to the B1 uh, symmetry species. So that's an irreducible representation. And then if you notice in the first column on the right there, it says x in that column. So that means that the character table is telling you how something that has this symmetry, so you can think of it as a px orbital or as a little unit vector pointing in the x direction. We're describing how that transforms under all the operations. And if you look below it, under b2 here, that one is, that one has a y, and so that tells you that that's how a p y orbital is going to transform under these representations, or under these symmetry operations. So all of these things are collected for you here in the character table. And this, is, this contains a lot of useful information. Okay, so what else is in here? We have um, rz, ry, and rx. Anybody know what those are? Rotation. Yeah, those are rotations. So those are rotations about those axes. So it takes a little bit of, uh, of work to, to visualize how to assign a rotation to a symmetry group. But uh, you know, if, if you think about it for a while, you can probably visualize it. We'll talk about it later when we get into to talking about spectroscopy. And then these other things, the um, x, y, x, z, y, z, Etc. These are quadratic terms in terms of the, the uh, Cartesian coordinates. You can think of them as d orbitals for now, or we'll see that they uh, that they belong to vibrate you know vibrational 
motions that change the polarizability of a molecule. So hopefully you get an idea of just how much information is already tabulated for you in the point group table. Question? Could you clarify what A1 and A2, B2, like what does that mean? Those are, ju those are just the names of the irreducible representations. And so all you really need to know about them is A and B are, are non-degenerate, so there's only one, one uh, symmetry species of that energy there. If it's called E, then it's going to be doubly degenerate. And if it's called T, then it's triply degenerate. And we'll see more examples of that. The other thing that, that you should know is that every point group has something, sometimes it's called A, sometimes it's called A1, sometimes it's called A1 prime, et cetera. It's always called A something where the, where, where the characters are ones for everything. So there's always a species where it remains invariant under any operation. And that's a sphere, right? A sphere always has that property. And so if we're talking about chemical bonding, you can think about that as an S orbital. And every point group will have that representation. Otherwise, you don't really need to, to worry about what those things are. They're just, they're just the names of the irreducible representations in that particular group. OK, so now let's look at Y and Z orbitals. So I'm going to go through this a little bit fast because it's our, you don't need to write it down. It's already on the character table, which is the, the joy of this whole thing. There's all this information already tabulated for you. And all you have to do is figure out how to read it. You don't have to generate it yourself every time. OK, so we already went through x. We know how that one behaves. So if we look at the, the pz orbital, we can see that that one doesn't change under the identity. C2 doesn't do anything to it. And neither do these reflections. So in this particular case, the z orbital the PZ orbital belongs to that symmetry group that, uh, you know, that doesn't change under any transformation, which in this case is A1. OK, so now I know uh, some people might be thinking, but what about in that case we were, where we were looking at the OCL2 and we had these orbitals you know, pointing in different directions and, and we got different answers for these? That's because in that case, my basis was the set of the two orbitals together. And so that means that uh, you know, when, when we have, so when we have a, an orbital in isolation like this, it, in this case, they belong to the irreducible representations. But if you start building up sets of them, then that might transform differently, and you can make up reducible representations for it. And we're going to learn how to deal with that. OK, so if we look at a y orbital, we can do the same thing. You know, again, I'm just going to go through it quickly. You can do it yourself for extra practice if you need to. And then now the next thing is let's look at this thing that's called A2 here. So that doesn't have uh, anything that belongs to the x, y, and z unit vectors, but there's, there are still some characters for it. If we think about it as a dxy orbital, we can see that uh, that's going to behave like this. So E and C2 aren't going to do anything to it, but it will change sign under those reflections. And so we get that under the A2 operation. And so sometimes if you look at, at these different point groups, there might be irreducible representations that are included for completeness, but you might notice that there's nothing listed under that you know, in terms of linear quadratic terms of the uh, Cartesian coordinates or rotations. You know, there might just be nothing in those categories. That's OK. It just means that there's nothing of chemical interest belonging to that symmetry species there. Yes? So the x, y, x, z, and y, z on the right, that all can also be basically visualized as a d orbital as well? You can, yeah. And they'll all work to all functions. Like the one negative one negative one one, they'll all be the same. They will they will transform according to that symmetry species. And you know again, how this is going to work and where these things go, totally depends on the point group. So if you if you look around at different ones, they'll belong to different representations. And so that's why it's so important when you start doing these problems to assign your molecule to, to the correct point group. Okay, so now we have made up. We have looked at. Uh, we know what irreducible representations are. We have at least seen 
some uh, practice examples of how to make up reducible representations. Let's look at how we get from one to the other. And there's a formula that we can use that's, uh, you know, you have to keep track of what you're doing, but it's conceptually not really hard. Okay, so what we want to know is we have some reducible representation that we're going to make up because it has to do with bonding or molecular motion or some property of the molecule that we're interested in. And we want to see how can we add up the various irreducible representations and, sorry, and, and get that reducible representation. So what we're looking for is, for example, the number of A1s that appears in your representation. So sometimes we can do this by inspection, but often it's not really that easy, particularly when we get into harder problems. We need to use this formula. Okay, so what we're going to do is add up the following things. So first of all, we, we have a, a, a 1 over H. So what's H? Remember, that's um, what you get when you add up the total number of operations. It's also called the order of the group. So the character table I gave you, unfortunately, doesn't uh, give you H, so you have to add it up yourself, but that's OK. And then what's in the sum here? Chi R is the character in the reducible representation. Chi I is the character in the irreducible representation. So remember, the reducible representation is whatever you generated that's going to help you solve the, the molecular problem. The character in the irreducible representation is the one from the table under that particular operation. And n is the number of equivalent operations in the class. So that means the coefficient in front of the, the uh, operation at the top of the table. So let's, uh, let's look at this. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Do you have questions about it, or is it just hard to, to, get, to absorb everything, get it written down? I have a question. Okay. You said you have to add something yourself. What do we add? Okay, so H is the number, it's the total number of operations in the class. So like for, for C2V, we have, um, so there's the identity, there's C2, and then there are, there's sigma V and sigma V prime. So H is four for that group. Some character tables give you the value of H, but this one doesn't, so you have to add them. Okay, so let's go through an example of how to use this. So here's a reducible representation. Again, if we're doing this in a realistic scenario, we're going to have made this reducible representation up ourselves because it's telling us something interesting that we want to know. In this case, for the sake of not taking forever, I'm just giving you an example of one that, that works. Okay, so now we're in the C3V point group. <coughs> You know, why, again, it's just an example. Okay, so for this one, H equals 6, because we have the identity, we have two C3s, and we have three sigma Vs. So we add up all of those and, and get 6. And so now we have to look at the character table and see how many irreducible representations we have. There are three. There's A1, A2, and E. And we have to figure out how many of each kind are added up to give us this reducible representation. OK, so we have 1 over 6 times. Now we're going to start adding this up. So for each operation in the table, we take the character in the reducible representation. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. I see your question, and I'll get to it when I, when I uh, finish explaining this really quick. OK. Um, so here the character in the reducible representation is 4 under E. And again, that's what we were given. 1 is the character under E in the irreducible representation. That we looked up from the table. And then 1 is the number of symmetry elements in that class. There's only one identity. 
And now we have to go through and do this for every operation that's possible in the C3V point group. So now for C3, we have one in our reducible representation, that's what we got from the problem, one from the character table that we looked up, and there are two C3 operations. And then we go through the same thing for the sigma V planes. And question back there. OK, cool. OK, so again, this has picky things that you have to keep track of, but it's not that hard. So we just have the, the character that we're given in the reducible representation. We have the character in the irreducible representation, in this case, A1, because that's what we're trying to figure out, which we look up from the table and the number of operations. And then we just have to go through and add these things for each element in the table. Question? I'm sorry, for the character in the reducible? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the problem. That's what I gave you. So that, that thing here that I'm calling gamma 1, oh, that was given. that's given. That's, that's the question. In real life, you're going to make that up yourself because it's going to help you answer a question that, that you want to know the answer to. I'm just giving you some to, to practice. We'll do a real example later on. If we don't get to it this time, we'll do it next lecture. So yeah, this, this capital gamma is just, that's a reducible representation that, that we're looking at. Okay, and so after all of this, um, we go through and find that there are no A1s in our particular representation. That's fine. Um, I want to point out here that if you do this and you don't get an integer number, something went badly wrong and you need to check your work. Okay, so now let's look at A2. We're just going down the table. We have to check out all of the possible irreducible representations. And so we do the same thing. So again, the identity, the character in the reducible representation is 4, that's given. The character under A2 is 1, that we look up on the table, and there's only one of it. And then we just go through and follow the, the characters under A2 and do the same thing for that symmetry species. And we get that there are two of them in this case. And then we have to do the same thing for E. So this is one of the things that, uh, that's a little bit challenging. Don't get confused about E, the symmetry species, and the identity operator E. They're, they have the same name, which is uh, not so ideal, but you can tell from context. OK, so we're looking for the number of the symmetry species E. And again, we go through and use our reduction formula for each operation in the table. And we get one. And so we went through all of the possible irreducible representations in this point group. And we use this reduction formula. And so we are done. And here's what the form of the answer should look like. We should say. Gamma 1 equals 2A2 plus E. So again, it's not, it's not hard. It's just you just have a lot of stuff to keep track of. And you know, it's fine to get 0 for these. In, in, you'll find that some reducible representations don't contain a particular irreducible representation. What you don't want to get is fractions. You, you really do need to get whole numbers for these things. So if you don't, go check your work. Yes? So I'm sorry, can you say again? Negative two below the three sigma V. That's the problem. That's what I gave you. The problem is here's this reducible representation, gamma one, reduce it. And you know, again, I want to point out when we do real ones, that's gonna come from something that, that we do as part of setting up the problem. Another question. So basically instead of writing a new symmetry group, we're gonna write it in terms of the already available symmetry group. That's right. And the reason that, that we want to do that is because we have all sorts of information about that on the character table and we can use it to learn stuff. Okay, let's try to bring this back to one discussion instead of many because it's really hard to hear what's going on. Another question. Uh, yeah, for the third term, okay, so the first term was 
irreducible, second term is irreducible? Yes. The third term is the number of operations in that class that are equivalent. So that's the coefficient in front of that operation. It's on the character table. So if you look at C3, there's a 2 in front of it. If you look at, at uh, sigma V, there's a 3 in front of it. OK, so everybody clear on our terminology and, and what we're going to do here? Because let's, uh, let's move on. OK, let's see another example. So I'm going to give you another example. We're in the same point group. And we're going to go through this again. And we're going to, we're going to do it fast because uh, we've already gone through it. However, if you get confused, I'm happy to answer questions about it. OK, so we need to go through the number of A1 again. And so now we have a different reducible representation, which we're calling gamma 2. And so in this case, when we go through this, we find that the number of A1s equals 1. And I guess what I want to point out here is that in this reducible representation, the same two, the first two uh, characters are the same and only the third one is different. We can get quite different answers from that. So it's not always easy to do them by inspection. Sometimes you can if you can just see what adds up that's a fine way to do it, but it's not always easy and the formula always works, so we definitely want to learn how to do that. Okay, so if we go through and get the number of A2s now, again using this formula, we get 1. And the same thing for the E symmetry species. And now we get 1 for that one. And so we can write gamma 2 as A1 plus A2 plus E. OK, so now we know how to use this reduction formula to um, reduce reducible representations and get some arbitrary representation in terms of um, the irreducible representations. As you can imagine, you could make up ones that don't work, right? So you, if, you, if you make up a reducible representation without it corresponding to, some, to something real in terms of chemical bonding or something like that, you can imagine coming up with sets of numbers that don't give you integers in terms of the, the point group. So, you know, if you're going to look for practice examples, you know, don't just make up arbitrary ones. It may not work. Okay, so let's, um, I had another one in here, but I don't think we need to do it. Let's quickly go through how we're going to set this up in terms of a real problem. We won't have time to finish this problem, but I at least want to set it up so that you can see it for next time and have, have a chance to think about it. OK, so let's think about bonding in a trigonal planar molecule. So to give you a concrete example, let's say it's BCL3. And what I want to know is which orbitals make up the, um, the sigma bonds in BCL3? And we all know the answer, right? What's the answer? What's the hybridization of the central atom? SP2. So at the end, we should get something that's consistent with that answer. But we're going to go through the process because uh, we're, we're, we'll see examples later that are not so simple. OK, so in order to figure out what which orbitals are involved in the bonding in this molecule, I'm going to take a basis that has to do with the problem that I want to solve. So I want to know about those sigma bonds. And so my basis is three vectors. I'm just calling them A1, A2, and A3, pointing in the direction from the central atom to each outer atom. And that's my basis. And I'm going to figure out by symmetry 
which orbitals have the appropriate symmetry to belong to those bonds. And I'm going to do that by making a reducible representation that corresponds to this basis. And then I'm going to reduce it and look at the character table and see which irreducible representations fit with that symmetry. So this is what we're going to do. So here's our basis. It's these three vectors. And now what I need to do is go through and figure out the character of my reducible representation under each of the symmetry operations. And so I can do that in a number of different ways. I can use uh, our heuristic if I'm careful. I can also set up the actual matrix for transforming this and then take its character. That'll always work. Let's just look at, uh, at how we do this. If we set up a, a vector that contains uh, you know, our three representations of the bonds and then just look at how that gets transformed under these operations. So we already know what the identity is going to be. That doesn't change anything, so we just get ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And so the character of the identity matrix is three. Okay, so now let's do a C3 rotation counterclockwise. And, you know, those who uh, want to look for mistakes, this is a prime way to, this is a prime place to make them. So make sure I didn't do it clockwise in the, in the matrix. Okay, so, yeah, it looks like I didn't mess it up. Good. All right, so we have uh, our, our vectors. I did a C3 rotation and we can look at how they changed places. And now I need the matrix that generates that. And so this is what we get. And its character is zero. And again, we can use the heuristic that all of these things swap places so we know our character has to be zero. <coughs> okay, so now how about C2? Question. So for a problem like this, we would get the, the rotated result and we just have to determine what the matrix is to achieve that rotation? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm going through, you know, what's the, what's the process for thinking about this? And so, you know, sometimes when you get really good at it, you can just kind of see it in your head. That's fine, but, you know, for, you know, it, it's kind of hard when you first start learning how to do it. So I want to make sure to go through step by step for all of these things. Question. So, so for uh, counterclockwise, you see that A3 takes place of A1. A1. Right. What, what clockwise would be the opposite? Clockwise would be, like you know, A2 would take the place of A1. And so then my, my matrix would be reflected about the diagonal, if that's. Know. My question is, how did you know which one was clockwise and which one was clockwise? You just have to do it. Set up the matrix and multiply it by your original thing and see what gives you the, the result that you want. The picture's going counterclockwise, yeah. In that case, the z-axis or what axis is going outside? Okay, this is, wait, so everybody listen, this is an important question. The question is what's the z-axis? The z-axis is always the principal axis that you determine when you put it in a point group. Okay. And then, so, that, so, we're it that way. so in, this, in this case, it's coming out at you. Okay, we're about out of time and this is a decent place to stop. We're gonna finish this next time. Also, you know, although our quizzes are unannounced, um, this is kind of a good point to maybe think about having one. So that's something that you should keep in mind for next week.